Everybody, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm proud to present uh, Bill Duddleston, founder and president of Legacy Audio and builder of my new favorite home speakers. Um, and we have his daughter, Victoria, joining us and Bryce Oksher, who is their audio technologist. Uh, so, hey, you guys, thanks for joining us today and presenting and telling us part of your story. Hi, Bryce. So I'll let you take it away, how you guys want to present Bill and, and manage the rest of the presentation. So I'm sorry, I will, one, I'm go ahead. sorry, Albert, I forgot one thing. So we'll uh, manage the questions from the audience um, via the chat box. So if you have questions, um, just put them in there and we'll, at appropriate intervals, we'll, we'll bring those up. To, to Bill and the group, okay? Thanks. Sounds good. Okay, Bill, take it away. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for having enough interest in what we do to make a, a part of your organization's event today. And, uh, um, you know, we started, started this company 37 years ago, almost 38 now, and uh, I feel like it's, it was just yesterday. It's exciting to, to be, Today, as it was back then, and uh, you know, we've been very what I call technology or engineering driven. Um, being the, the head of the company, I never had to let uh, uh, accountants or, or marketing people control the company. It's always been something I've basically pursued, and I think most of the successful high-end audio companies are very much that way. Um, seems to be you have a vision of what you're trying to achieve and you stay focused on it and uh, developing our our products uh i always figured if i couldn't do as well as the other guys i must not even have a product in that category um and when i say as, to do as well uh, i mean in terms of uh, overall performance and i'll get into what i think performance is and then uh, value uh you can't uh, make it as good a value as the other guy then and um, I don't think it's a, you're, I, I, I'm not interested in kind of participating in that category. I, do, I stay out of the, uh, I won't say the cheap speakers, but the budget speakers on the lower end of the spectrum. Um, I, I can't create what I'll call a legacy difference down at that level. And uh, so most of our products are quite stout. Uh, there's a lot going into them. They're, they're, they're heavy made, they're well made. Um, and uh, we follow Hoffman's iron law, or technology in any way, that you can't have a uh, deep bass, a small box, and high efficiency all in, in one thing. You got to trade off something. And uh, the beauty of, of technology today is that uh, amplifier technology has moved along so far that we actually have uh, enough power capability to try to overcome some of the box size issues. But in general, you still can't beat the, the fifth scenario issue. And uh, I think that when it comes right down to having enough uh, piss scenario to uh, reproduce the frequencies that you're trying to drill, drive and, and do it at a, a low enough distortion level. So our, our design philosophies have, have always followed um, almost like a, a seeing sound and the wavelengths involved as almost the shape of a pyramid, if you will, in terms of you can't build a speaker with a great top end unless you have a good footing underneath it. Um, if you picture, if you're trying to build a pyramid and make it taller, which would be great higher by hand frames, if you will, um, you have to have a big bottom end. You have to have a lot of piston area down on the bottom. You have to have air moving capability. And if you start at that, uh, that fundamental, um, you can end up with a speaker that has great dynamic range. Um, but I think today, the thing that's most overlooked in audiophile speakers is uh, acceleration factor. And uh, you can have full frequency range. Um, you can have, you know, bandwidth. You can have uh, a speaker that images pretty well. But if you don't have articulation, uh, you're not really maximizing what a loudspeaker can do. 
um, our drivers that we we use had typically had acceleration factors that are more than double of what the competitor speakers do. And um, those seem like big words, but I can tell you that we were more than happy to demonstrate that factor um, in, in any of our data. Uh, sometimes you'll have a, a driver that an audio file company will try to build, for example, a speaker that has a very flat, naturally inherent flat frequency response, um, then we'll cross over. And so you end up with something that, um, try to come closer, Bryce, that yeah. I know. Okay, I can pull in more. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Some baritone in there now. Thanks, we'll um, see how that does. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, but the, uh, I, th I think the thing that, that you have to look at is, um, when you have acceleration factor, it's typically a lower Q, more highly damped driver. And so the QE is, is, is a pretty low number. And so you have more magnetic control over the driver and the rising, the response of the driver inherently is rising. And uh, with the exception of the subwoofer, the, the deepest base driver, that's a characteristic I always try to achieve in my driver individually. When they fall together, um, you end up with uh, each, if each one is rising comparably, uh, when it's all summed together, it's just as flat, but you end up with a much better transient characteristic. And uh, the other thing is, is that when you move off axis, it inherently rolls off um, almost uniformly. Uh, if, the, if the rising response on, let's say I have a mid-range driver, is slightly rising on axis, and then if mid-base, is rising on axis. Um, when you move off axis, they all kind of fall down together and you maintain a higher directivity and a better, um, more uniform uh, frequency response as a result. What I don't like to see is when you move off axis and the whole thing just kind of falls apart or collapses. Or um, That's why I don't put a lot of energy in two ways. I have, I have a speaker called the studio, but in general, um, the multi-way loudspeaker uh, gives us a lot more, more possibility. Um, looking at the, the characteristics of loudspeakers, I think the valuable part of a loudspeaker is that it, it must uh, bring clarity. Um, clarity is low distortion. It is also dynamic range. If you uh, cannot articulate the peaks, um, that's something that, that these high power amplifier capabilities, for example, like in our IV series amplifiers, why do we need an amplifier with that kind of power? Well, um, when you uh, have a speaker, for example, as, as Albert has right now, one of our speakers, and um, you know that that even at low levels, the transcription capability of that loud speaker uh, is, is so much snappier um, due to its dynamic range. And even though you may not be taking it to its maximum limits, the speed that falls out of that is pretty pretty amazing. So um, we like a lot of air movement capability. Um, uh, having higher power amplifiers, for example, when we went to 24-bit recordings uh, capability in playback, you end up with a new system requirement for 24-bit because your dynamic range just stepped up 34, 35 dB. And the way I look at it is if you took half of that and use it downward, um, in other words, making the system quieter overall, and at the same time step it up, 17, 18 dB going the other way, in terms of dynamics, you have a, a very nice system. So you have the ability to get your noise floor way down. And I can remember recording piano uh, through, my, through my entire career. And it always got to me that I could not in analog, ever record um, a piano and without clipping it and still have a reasonable noise floor. You get to a live performance on such a percussive instrument. Um, unless you were like mid hall, you would never get the, the feeling or the dynamics of what a piano could do without, without uh, in the quiet passages, the noise floor is pulling way up on you. And um, that was a lot of stuff that was manipulated in the days where you're you had a master tape and you'd have to try to either use like a DBX or two to one compression or 
Dolby or something, or just gain right to trouble so that when you get to the quiet passages, they knock the take this down when it went to the master recording. And with 24 bit technology, you just don't have that issue anymore. Or the bit depth is so great, um, you can set your recorder and almost let it go because uh, you have all that added dynamic range, top and bottom, if you will. <clears throat> I think that when people say dynamic range, I think one of the the misgivings is that people confuse that thinking loud, and it's just not the case. It's like having contrast for black or blacks and white or whites, you know. And uh, when it, when I look at tonality, timbre, and all the things that um, come along with resolution, uh, some things I'm constantly learning. I think I'm learning at a faster rate now than I did when I was, when I was very young, because there are more and more pieces follow together all the time. Um, an example of that is that uh, when we developed uh, the room correction technology with Mayor uh, Bomer in Sweden, um, I had no anticipation that it would actually enhance timbre and change the, 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 the actual timbre of sound. And by golly, it does a, quite a great deal. Um, and I... Uh, we, we looked at, we did a number of studies, and uh, if I can get Victoria around here somewhere, I'll have her pull up a picture for you. But basically, one of the things that I, I learned was that, you know, there's things that we have that are resonances that, that can color music that's in room playback. And, uh, oh, here we go. Beautiful. Um, that image right there that you're looking at, that is what the room correction uh, of a before and after, if you will. And to make a long story short, on the left-hand side, if you can picture what that, that shape is, um, that little cone of energy, if you will, uh, the scale is time and time. So one's frequency and the other one's time. And uh, frequency is cycles per unit time, and the other one is time. So you can see how important uh, time domain is when you're looking at the response here. Now that is uh, what a frequency response looks like in the time domain, as opposed to this line we're used to seeing on, a, on an axis that that uh, looks like a frequency response curve. And you can see, for example, in that picture on the left there, the um, red is lower frequencies, and uh, um, you can see the uh, as, as it uh, affects the scale, and it comes to a point uh, at the top that's more in the higher frequency range. But as we move across the spectrum at the bottom of scale, you can see this smear that's going on. Now, if you look at the upper part of the graph, you can notice that it's kind of like an event cone, if you will, in time. And you would anticipate that the after shape should look just, just like the before shape. Well, it certainly doesn't. And you can see, almost looks like there's a storm going on. And you see this overhang in the mid base and base range. And you see all these reflections and flutters and so forth going on. And if you look at it after the correction has been ran, um, one of the, the the attributes is that you when you correct in the time domain, you have a, a real chance to to make things correct overall. If you correct in a frequency domain, if I go in with an EQ and I boost and cut, boost and cut, boost and cut across the spectrum, I'm making it if, if the if the speaker was putting out something correct in the first place or approaching that. When I try to correct it that way, I'm making it inaccurate virtually everywhere else in the room I'm measuring. I'm not measuring as opposed to uh, where my microphone is. And the other thing is too, is even when you do correct uh, on your, at one position in the room, you just simply isolate on that one spot, you're, you're, um, you're boosting areas that have dips and those boosts basically uh, really don't fill in the dips. What happens is, is the thing that caused the dip is being reinforced. And so the dip really doesn't go away. You're just dumping lots and lots of power, making your cone work really hard, your drivers work hard, but you're not really making a correction. So uh, correcting things in the, in the time domain is, is really what uh, DSP's capabilities are and what, what we need to look at. Um, some interesting factors that uh, I, one of the things I learned was that I had been blaming room resonances on, uh, on 
face sloppiness um, in some situations in rooms. And it's, it's not the case. Um, there are cases where you can develop a room resonance, for example, with a steady state organ node or something like that. But factually, um, what you have uh, when you look at uh, the frequency response in a, in a room, basically, um, you see peaks and dips and stuff like that. But what you can't see is all the time smear. That's due to the, the sequence of arrivals. Now, picture, if you will, you're launching a, a, a loudspeaker system, say two loudspeakers, and they're, they're, they're throwing out a low frequency wave. And, um, and this can go all the way up into the, the middle mid range. This is quite true. But the energy that when, when the left speaker and the right speaker fire, um, first of all, they're sharing it off, off of each other, you might say, with the radiation fields, the actual fields even though they're separated by some distance. Um, they also share energy with the walls off to the sides and the, and the floor. And, the, and at very low frequency, particularly the wall behind them. Now, what happens is, is you know, you got your, your, your ears and pin them or pin a gathering sound and, and it excites your, your, your tympanum, but that is a very small pixel of space, if you will, that, that this is occurring at. Meanwhile, the room, is reinforcing all this sound that's late, and um, in some cases reinforcing, some cases canceling. But you get this large tsunami of days that is quite late compared to the original arrival. It might be it might be 15 milliseconds later. It might be 10 milliseconds later. But one for sure, it's much stronger than what went past the year the first time. So when you correct that. And so that when it arrives, it arrives appropriately in time. Um, the timbre or the overall pitch of things uh, is greatly improved. The clarity is improved, and the uh, the base weight has, has more uh, uniform drive to it. And you don't have that muddiness or thickness that you're um, always trying to sort things out of. So, and there's some audio files that. Uh, but actually so choose a speaker with less bass just to get better definition sometimes over the years um, or speak with a, a attenuated bass just because that it helps them hear the top end. Well, there's no reason for that. Um, I had built some very high directivity loudspeakers like the Whisper system, which is it's still the world's uh, widest bandwidth high directivity loudspeaker system. And uh, you, could, you could literally walk off, walk off axis and a speaker would, would track you because um, if you cross-fired them, the right one would attenuate while the, uh, you know, the left one was coming up and vice versa. So the one you're farthest from would actually be coming more on axis because of the crossfire. Well, that, that is a very desirable characteristic and gives you a much larger sweet spot. Um, if you have two speakers that are, for example, the other extreme omnidirectional, and you're sitting between them, if you move a little left, you're going to get a lot of left. If you move a little right, you're going to get a lot of right because of the, the nature of it, um, of the distribution pattern on it. And uh, so that's a uh, directivity is a big deal, but when you directivity is automatically factored in when you go to uh, time domain correction. Um, you can go stand in a corner. Uh, this is thing that, that Albert can testify. Um, he can. He, he listens to something with some bass. He can go stand in a corner and the room won't have a heavy spot or drone in that corner because it won't build up that stand, that, that pressure zone. Um, it's being attenuated just as fast as it started. It wants to stop. And uh, so that's a, a, a big advantage. And that, that's the room correction side. So directivity, room correction, dynamic range, um, acceleration factor, uh, these are all things that I think are the most important factors with uh, loudspeakers. Well, Bill, just uh, we're still having a little bit of issue with your your audio. It's kind of okay. breaking up. So. Okay. Is so. it the cable breaking up, or what are you getting on your end, Bryce? Yeah, it's just kind of choppy. Is it your cable? Someone suggested that you guys can go into the audio setting and suppress background noise. And, yeah, we've uh, got, if you guys can hear me, we've got uh, we've got the suppression background noise set to low. Um, 
And so I, that's the best we can set it on the software itself. Yeah, power is on, right? Yeah. Let's just turn up the overall maybe if I change. Thanks for checking it though. How's the level there? Is that better? Worse? It was funny. It wasn't the volume that was a the problem. There was just a, a lag or a chop that entered into it. Maybe, maybe just being closer to the mic would be good. That sounds like a digital issue. <laughs> mm hmm. Try again there, Bill, a little closer to the mic and we'll see what it sounds okay. like. Yeah, how's, cool. how's it been? So far, so good. Yeah, good. Okay. What are you getting, kind of a digital uh, chunkiness? Or? Yeah, it was sound like kind little, of chopping off bit. at times. Um, we're huh. just missing you on the center of the screen a little here. But um, someone asked, what's the mathematical definition of acceleration factor? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's your um, it's your DL of rating your magnetic uh, capability. You're factoring if you think about um, the units of measure of acceleration. It's it's basically velocity per time. And uh, so, if you look at the the moving mass of the system, and then you look at the acceleration capability from the magnetic system. Um, so your BL product basically dictates what the magnetic drive is, and then the cone mass is factored into that. So, uh, you know, it's, that's basically the, the parameters that you're looking at. And you can have, for example, there's a, uh, a belief that if you use a really lightweight diaphragm and you use a, uh, for example, a large planar speaker, the problem is that you distribute the magnetic field uh, so broadly that you don't have a real uh, high sensitivity as a result. And um, you see this with electrostatics, for example, the trade-off has and always been um, that if you get your grid, your, your, your electrocharged grid closer together, um, then you're more likely to burn your diaphragm and you reduce your dynamic range, but your sensitivity comes up. And so uh, it's, it's always a trade-off. And if you have a, a really light mass, for example, you can use RLR film or, or what have you to actually become the, the, the diaphragm material and even photo graphite or whatever as a conductor. But in the end, uh, you still have the limitation of, of the magnetic field that is or the electrostatic field that you're driving it and the distance ball and inverse square law with energy always applied and uh, so power laws so you end up with less overall power that's a good answer thanks all right i don't see any other questions you can continue on if you like bill sure no i think i think that um one of the things that I'll uh, share with you a little bit in terms of research, the things that we like to work on um, in sound field recreation, uh, wave launch re restoration and, and arrival of, of the sequence arrival that you see in the real world, in the free field and in uh, rooms. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because so many times, you know, we're, we're checking things out on YouTube or something, we're in headphones and whatever. But um, when you get, uh, for example, I, I have a very high quality binaural head. Um, with this, it's not just test equipment microphones, but they're musical instrument recording microphones, high end uh, recording microphones built into the head. Um, so it doesn't sound like it's a, just a, a piece of test equipment with steel diaphragms like a B and K or something like that. Um, but what we're uh, able to do with the binaural head is record a venue and then play that recording back, um, listen to that recording over headphones, and uh, and then at the same time record 
that same event as you normally would record it and play that back through speakers and then record that with the binaural head. Now, my point is, is we now have apples and apples for comparison. So say that one more time, I recorded an event uh, directly from uh, the actual event going into the, the head. And then I do the same thing, uh, which is actually recording the event as you normally would with microphone placements and so forth. The process itself indicates very quickly, there's a lot of things we're not doing as well as we could in the recording process. For example, uh, we tend to use a single microphone. Hello. Sorry about that. That was feedback from my, my headphones. Um, the, uh, uh, but uh, when you look at what we're trying to do with, with uh, A-B comparison of playback with loudspeakers, um, there's there needs to be a reference. What, how do you know that what you have is, is correct? Is it subjectively correct? Well, that you can indeed do that. You can indeed record an event and then record it um, with the same, for example, the binaural head and actually listen to the two. So um, you can compare things. Now, even the binaural head has some severe limitations, and that is there is no sinus passages in binaural heads. And you ever uh, notice that when you have a stuffy nose uh, that uh, people say, well, my hearing's off today, or um, I'm just congested, I can't hear well. And what's happening there is that you, you are, uh, through your station tubes, um, you have a dipolar eardrum. No one talks about this. I haven't seen this written anywhere, but I can tell you that I've studied this stuff and the, the uh, the psychologist, Dr. Bella Ulis out of Rutgers. And uh, the thing about it is that, that when you listen to things, you're listening very much through your, your sinus cavities. And if you were to uh, listen to some steady state noise, like pink noise, and pinch your nose while you're listening to it, you're going to hear a lot of change in timbre and, and color. And uh, uh, I remember when uh, Dave Grissinger, um was trying to use binaural recordings to record things in symphony halls and get great results. And uh, it's just, you know, you guys are kind of the land of John Ergel back in the old days and so forth. And, um, there was a, just a, a whole lot of great recordings made by Ergel. And one of the things that, that Gresson you noted was that uh, you could try to find a spot in the hall and make a recording but it never quite sounded right when you played it back. So he just took a third microphone, if you will, besides the binaural head, put it out in front of the head and created a timing offset. So to kind of represent, now nobody was justifying why he did this, but he did that simply so that you could get that, that, that sense of what's going on with the sinus passages. Now that's, um, there's good scientific uh, research behind that. Uh, that that uh, that belief. Um, the other thing too is that, that a lot of people misunderstood how they hear, misunderstand how the hearing mechanism works. And first of all, your um, it is in a quite an extent a, a bit of a digital process in that uh, the way that, that neurons fire and the way that um, electrical energy is transmitted to the brain and the way the brain decodes it and so forth. But the, um, and it had definitely has a sampling rate to what's interesting, but the cilia that propagate the, the wave within the eardrum, um, they basically function at about 500 hertz. Uh, if frequencies above that are like riding piggyback or carrier on the flexor of the cilia, so the, the brain is almost looking for aliasing, if you will, to try to, to uh, simulate or, or differentiate, that's a better word, um, the higher frequency components. And uh, that is largely why we don't have a lot of quantitative evaluation capability uh, up high, but we also um, lack qualitative assessment of above about 10K to 12K. Uh, even if you can hear 20 kilohertz, you can't assign uh, a value to the quality of it, you either hear it or you don't. Now, when we talk about treble and brightness, 
Um, that's usually a, something that's closer in the present span, three to five K. If we hear siblings, that's around eight K. But uh, you know, sometimes if we hear a little excess at 10K, it sounds tizzy. 10 to 12K, that's a tizzy type sound. But the air that uh, a lot of recording engineers have, have worked to try to um, get back in our recordings. In fact, there used to be an air button on a number of consoles that you could add the air back in, which was just a massive boost, uh, like you could use it on ribbon microphones or whatever. And, it would, you know, give you a big jam up at around 16K. Well, that uh, has a lot to do with why we need that component is, first of all, anytime you sum two things that are shorter in wavelength than, say, uh, one kilohertz or so, um, and even at, even at really, even though, say, 200 hertz is low as 200 hertz or so, you'll start to see some of this happening. But when you sum things up, you start to get partial cancellation. But at very high frequency, the wavelengths are so short relative to the travel times that if I if I took an instrument that is um, something in the left channel and I mix it with something in the right channel that was picking up some of the same stereo effect, when you sum that together, it's going to happen just like when we were kids and you hit the mono button on your FM tuner, um, the top end dropped, but all the noise went. And uh, so back when you had weak broadcast in the old days, you'd go to your tuner, you hit mono to lock the signal in, you get rid of the junk, the LMSR component of noise. But what's happening is, is you're losing high frequency content anytime you sum two tracks together. It's just that simple. You can gain noise, but at the same time, your high frequencies are wanting to cancel each other out. And um, so the recording engineer typically has to apply progressive boost in, in the tape, and sometimes that causes us to, in the old days tape has to come up. With the way we do it, with, um, if we went to two microphones and recorded everything in true stereo, so if I had a jazz ensemble, for example, and I could get my um, ORTF or Bloom Line mic set up, and I could record that thing at a comfortable distance where it's it always sounds a lot farther away than it is. But if you uh, because the lack of selectivity that the mic has compared to your brain. But if the if the mics are, are some reasonable distance to pick up the whole ensemble and the stereo pair, that's one thing. But if you try to spot mic each instrument, then bring it together and mix, it's never quite right. And the reason is that you're not using two microphones in one sound source, and the ear would strongly prefer that you did. So when you put it all together, you would store the vectors of that sound instead of a bunch of scalers. So pan, panning a bunch of scalar components across the horizon uh, to try to create a stereo spread or a sense of depth or whatever um, is, is definitely something that uh, can be done better. And I think wiser engineers are, are kind of hip to that or, or starting to pick up on that. So. Hey, Bill, someone asked, what are the mites in the um, binaural head? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm Got a couple of them. The one I'm actually liking the best is uh, because of its physical size, um, is a Rode NTA one. Is my head up here? Grab that thing over for me. Can you repeat that? The yeah, it's a, mic? a Rode, uh, Rode NTA ones. And uh, they have a NT1 and an NT1A. I'll uh, see if I can show you the actual uh -huh. condensers there actually in the ear canal. Now, I, wow. I didn't put them at the base of the canal. The, the disadvantage of, of doing that is that you know, I'm building a personal transfer function. So I'm not trying to put my ear canal on this head. I'm letting your ear canal take over. Um, so when you put your headphones on, uh, it's picking up where your uh, microphone is actually. So if you look at this, it's the mic is just inside the pinna, like that top. And uh, it's positioned the same way on the other side, obviously. But um, and that's a just a, a wonderful tool for evaluating what your loudspeakers are doing. Um, uh, over the years, I've developed a number of tools for for evaluating imaging. For example, people say, "Well, you can't measure imaging." But sure, you can. You very definitely can. If I take uh, imaging, it is correlation capability of a loudspeaker system. Sound staging is is more of a diffuse element. 
Um, and hopefully the sound stage you get is not your room diffusion, but actually the recordings uh, diffusion. It was building the recording. And um, if you're uh, here again, I think about my SUT developments that we have in the, the speakers for creating a sense of uh, storing the sense of space. But when you look at how the, the the whole thing comes together and how we try to sum information um, uh, and, and portray things across the sound stage, we definitely have a lot better capability uh, today than we did before. But I think we need more wisdom in what we're doing, more guidance. Thanks. You guys got any girls in your uh, organization? We got 300. The reason, I, the reason I'm asking, it, every time I get a, a hot prospect for a summer candidate or something, it's female. And the uh, um, these girls are coming on strong in audio engineering now. And, uh, you know, we've had a number of presents uh, recently in the audio engineering society. And, um, it's like girls are finally catching on here. And uh, it's kind of exciting. Yeah, our both. Our president is a woman, and uh, we have several members that are women as well. So, yeah, we are looking to get younger members as well. So that's important. Yeah, I think uh, I have said for many years, I think our whole industry uh, in, in the clubs and the music industry in general would really benefit from going out to the college campuses even if, it's during, even if it's during summer sessions and setting up tables and, and with headphones and, and letting people uh, A, B, high end recordings and, and hear some things and through high quality playback equipment. And um, I suggested this a while back, that if we came up with a little industry gold near badge, if you will, that, that uh, you know, see if you can pass this test. You know, can you identify this? Where does this image appear to you? in this recording and so forth and um, get them to participate and realize what what is out there. I, I think the young people would be very excited by it. I've done this type of thing a number of times at our own facility. And man, I'll tell you, these kids are just stick to you like glue. I've had three of them I did it with, uh, two particular. And when they were in eighth grade, it came through here. And they both turned out to be phenomenal engineers that are that are uh, um, it's just inspirational when you can make something that's that simple. I mean, if you think think about wine tasting and how it's a participation act, I think that's where audiophiles could really get a message out there and, and uh, get more people involved uh, besides just you know watching videos and stuff. I think they can actually participate in the audio side and, and uh, realize that they, they, they do have discerning capabilities. No, we love turning people on to hearing all that you can hear in a fine audio system. And uh, it, it's a lot better in my world now, but I remember when I was early 20s and uh, a friend set up a pair of Infinity Kappa 8 speakers with uh, Bob Carver sonic holography and we're noticing things out beyond the speakers and it is super exciting. And it was new. Um, and yeah. so there is that excitement for the young age and it just keeps us going through all oh, yeah. the audio in interest. Yeah, I remember listening to the Dark Side of the Moon going to that audio dealer, Dark Dolphus DQ10s and playing them back with that holography and going, wow, I'll listen to that over there. You know, pretty <laughs> I neat. know. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's still a, it's fun today. And if you look at the, the virtual science that's going on with the, with the optics, um, I mentioned Bella Eulas earlier, but this guy is a father of psychoacoustics, and uh, he introduced himself to me a number of years ago and um, randomly called me, and uh, we got into some conversation. He ended up sending me 3D glasses, a whole box full of books and stuff for me to read, and I did not realize the parallels between visual uh, three-dimensionality and acoustic three-dimensionality. It's the brain's feeding off all that stuff and it compares the differences between left and right in the same way. So there's a there's a lot of cool stuff you can do in audio that, that we haven't even touched upon yet. Mm -hmm. We're working right now on getting that sound that appears 
uh, in the center of your head of headphones, getting it out in front. And I mentioned one of the things that's lacking right now is that um, your sinus cavity is basically entering into the picture. So we have to simulate that from the signal that's coming in. And if we hard pan something to your left ear, you hard pan something to your right ear, um, which is automatically going to happen when you wear a pair of headphones, you end up with um, a, a lump sum that's right in the middle, the middle of your head. And uh, so, uh, and you can, and the other thing too is I'll encourage you to all to try this, but intentionally flip the polarity on one of your channels, see what happens. It ain't going to do what you think it's going to do because you don't get that giant inversion. Everything moves out to the outside, to the left or the right, like you do in acoustic space. Because in acoustic space, you're hearing amplitude cancellation. But the brain does not operate that way. Um, it's the acoustic cancellation that causes that things to move to the outside, um, just like sonic calligraphy used to do. Um, but uh, when you when you flip the polarity on your, on your right hand from the to your left, don't look for that image to jump outside your head. It just doesn't work that way. Bill, what is the name of that audio engineer you were mentioning? Bella? Bella Eulis. Bella yeah. Eulis, U-L-A-S? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, brilliant, brilliant man. Someone asked yeah. about that. Thanks. Yeah, he, what it, one of the things he did was he uh, uh, had diagnosed uh, in newborn babies, um, if they were premature, he could tell whether or not they had vision through their eyes properly. Um, and if they had stereoscopic vision, if both eyes were tracking and stuff. And the reason how he did it was they would apply stimulus to the left and right ears. And if, this, if the eyes didn't track at a very early age, um, you could tell there was there were going to be developmental issues there. All right. How are we doing on the kind of the outline of the presentation here, Bryce? Bryce, you want to uh, do your end of it now? Yeah, we can. Uh, are we going to do, do up here? Or, uh, <clears throat> show you some more electronics, or you want to see any of that stuff? We love seeing stuff. Okay. All right. Well, Victoria has uh, some electronics over there. That's one of our, our power block amplifiers. And we have a, it's a oh. compact design. It's an ice power design also. And it's, we have them in two and four channel versions. And um, that's a very high quality amplifier. Delivers outrageous amounts of power in a, in a compact enclosure. And um, uh, the some people buy two power block fours and they'll have eight channels to drive their own theaters or whatever. Um, and next to it, we have the IV series. And uh, the IV amplifier, um, people like, what are you talking about that name IV? Well, power is current times voltage and thus IV. But uh, that amplifier that you're looking at right there is available in monoblock right on through uh, up to eight channels of capability all in one chassis. And we also have an, a, 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 an ultra series version of that amplifier um, that you can get, which is the two channel and the, the four channel ultra. Um, what the four channel ultra is, it's actually the equivalent of the eight channel amplifier, but all the power supply is being dedicated to four channels. So um, you're not sharing power supplies as you do on the eight channel version. And nice. uh, they all they all put out lots of power. Um, the execution of that amplifier. What are we doing to a standard ice power unit to make it better than it already is? Well, first of all, it starts with isolation, uh, grounding, uh, having, for example, on our mono block, we actually have a seven pound copper grounding block in the chassis. Seven pounds of copper actually in the chassis. Um, on this. Uh, amplifier like the twos and the fours or whatever. Um, we have uh, it's obviously all soldered connections at the terminals. They're real jacks. That's not those things that poke through the holes and wiggle when you go plug stuff in. This is really hand soldered uh, connections. Even the heat sinks are individually grounded. But we took a lot of time in designing this amplifier in, in terms of how to mount, prevent oscillation, uh, how to uh, provide adequate heat sink 
the, the biggest disappointment I had in, in class D amplification over the last 10 years was literally the under execution of good technology. Um, example of that failure rate on subwoofer amplifiers was god awful. Our early products um, that we had in the class D realm did not hold up. We ended up replacing all that stuff out in the field with, with things that had long life. And uh, what's, what's uh, interesting is, is, yeah, you can get away with fewer output devices in theory because um, of the way the opera supply works, but that's not quite the case with, uh, um, with, with our designs. What we do is we use plenty of output devices. We use lots of heat sink area and apply good conventional technology to uh, reinforce the design. So plus the really good uh, fit and finish. Those are good looking. And, oh, thank you. Hey Bryce, you wanna you wanna take them over on the yeah, and yeah I'll get set up. Uh, yeah. Let me see. Okay, adjust some audio settings here, gentlemen and ladies, and we're gonna try something here. Bryce, you sound clear and good. No breakup. You guys hear us any better uh, with this new microphone? You sounds clear. Okay. Okay. Great. And which mic are you using? Yeah, hear. right now we're on the internal mic, so maybe just got some settings, uh, just a little more set here. Uh, great. I will head over, and uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions for Bill right now, would be a great, uh, great time to ask. I'm looking at the chat. If anyone wants to send in a question, I can relay that. Someone asked about phantom imaging. Is that anything you try to work towards or differentiate? Phantom imaging? Yeah, in the stereo stage. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, yeah, panning is one thing when you go from left to right, uh, you can pan across the sound stage. There was even a series of leader test tones that were created a number of years ago that could, you could create a sense of relative height. Um, you can't perceive height um, unless it's relative to an original tone. So they had a, a sound test that would make the sound look, sound like it was almost climbing up the wall um, years ago. And depending on the polarity of your speaker and how they operated, with some speakers, the sound actually went into the floor and other ones it would go up, but uh, depending on your polar tilt of your own speakers. But uh, the imaging, phantom imaging, um, is an amazing thing. Uh, it's what makes stereo, stereo so successful is, is that you're getting this illusion of something being where it's not. And that's a whole lot of fun. And I think that, that for that reason, a lot of there are a lot of stereo diehards that really don't care so much for home theater compared to stereo. Now I will tell you that um, there is much better capability out there than what you're used to in stereo. Um, obviously, you know if you've heard the Valor system, um, you know what SUTs are capable of doing, and there's an extrusion going on there that separates. The, the frontal sounds from the more distant sounds, and then the late ambient field. And so you have that sensation that you can virtually lean into the picture and look around one performer to see another. And um, it's like an embossing on an otherwise two-dimensional stage. Now, if you shut that technology down, um, you're going to hear something that sounds like um, sound stretched across the cold clothesline between two two tweeters, one on the left, one on the right, and everything seems to be about the same height stretched across, and, you, and your depth collapses. Your imagination tries to add depth, but the reality of it is is that there's a lot better way of doing it. And uh, anybody that's heard Albert's Maller system will get an idea about that. Right? So this leads, this leads to a good question. Sorry about my echo coming through. Um, so when asked, so what is the SUT? And I think it's addressing exactly what you're talking about. It's giving that sound staging and height 
but I'll let you answer the question. The question was, what is SUT? Okay, SUT stands for Stereo Unfold Techno Technology. Um, we're, we're kind of branding that um, something less technical, and we're going to call it Omnio. And so you'll see if you hit that button on the newer processor, it'll just say Omnio. But Stereo Unfold basically is that it's rendering the calculations to restore the vectors on the signal path um, as if every sound was actually picked up by two microphones. And um, uh, it's uh, very solid technology and it sounds wrong when you turn it off because it's, it's fundamentally correct in what it's doing. So stereo and unfold technology is what the SU2 st stood for. And then someone was asking um, how you address, how the leg legacy speakers address the key issues you've just been talking about. Um, you know, and when it comes to room interaction and room effects, um, for example, uh, first of all, we use lots of piston area and a, a large speaker can pump up the pressure in a room and pump it down faster. No question about it. There's, I hear the term, a large speaker can overpower a room. Man, I've never believed that. And I'll put a pair of dollars in, in an eight by 10 room and sit in airfield on them because it, it's just not going to overpower the room because you have the volume control. You control the level you're playing back at. But the, the smaller speaker is subjectively uh, influenced by the room and it's going to be dominated by the wall's boundaries. So you kind of have to get a sympathetic loading. And uh, for example, we build a very good on-wall speaker, which is in our Silhouette series. And the Silhouette speaker, what's, what's cool about the Silhouette is that uh, it uses the boundary as, and, and knows it's mounted against a wall. So everything about that speaker is normalized for that. Even the crossover frequency uh, is set at the wall depth. That's something Roy Allison used to do years ago on some of his early speakers, but the crossover frequency between the 10 inch woofer and the seven inch mid bass is set exactly where the phase rotation is from cancellation. So by by putting a second order high pass filter there on that seven, that, uh, seven inch driver, it's back in phase and at that transition point. And that's just um, using your head in terms of, of how to build a speaker. But those are, those are some of the things that we do. In general, um, when you have larger pistons, your directivity is better by nature. But um, one thing for sure, if you have the motor structure, you can stop and start things faster. I'll add one other thing along those lines. You know, recently I wanted to develop a, I, I, I wanted to use an eight inch driver in an application of a project I was working on. And I couldn't find an eight inch driver that had decent bass and sensitivity that was reasonable in, in terms of a subwoofer or a bass driver. And I'm telling you, it was, it was unbelievable. I, I think I ordered uh, all kinds of car woofers that would handle lots of power, but not generate much sound unless they were stuck in a sealed uh, a trunk or something. Um, and I looked at, so power handling and, and sound output are not the same thing. Um, the other thing is I was looking for a driver that actually was durable. I didn't want a voice coil that was going to bottom out and get hammered every time you cranked it up. But I wanted to be able to hit it hard. Um, think of back when Bob Carver came out with the amazing subwoofer or whatever that little subwoofer was he had. Yeah, and it, you could drive it hard. Well, so I started working on this. Eight inch driver, pull it out here, show you where I'm at on it. But it's a carbon fiber driver. And I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but this is the kind of excursion I'm talking about. Can you see the displacement on that? I don't know if you can. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's huge. You're stretching that surround pretty well. Yeah, you notice it's not bottoming out. You only hear the back voice coil hitting the back plate. Okay. There was nothing like this in existence. I had to create it. Um, uh, it, it was I used a carbon fiber technology and so on and so forth. And I, I'm still working, developing the driver. It's in its final version right now. But um, that's an example of how legacy attacks problems. You can't always uh, find what you're looking for out there. And we're 
not too proud to sample what the other guys are doing. Um, Vic's got a, a curve that you, I would like to show you real quick. That is nothing more than a number of uh, mid-range drivers that I've looked at. And this, this will be useful to you guys. But this is, if you look on the left there, you see a, a high quality SEAS Exelon mid-range. You've seen that in a number of loudspeakers. And that's the curve on the bottom. The one above it is our driver. First of all, you notice our driver is smoother. It has less raggedness. It doesn't have the peak that the yellow curve has on the breakup mode on the top. But look at the sensitivity difference. I mean, it's it's just unbelievable. But you're looking at, you know, uh, here I'm looking at what 98 dB relative to an 84, and uh, so that difference between those loudspeakers is is what legacy is all about. Now that's not knocking that driver. I'm just saying that look if if you ramp up the motor on that thing, and here's an example of what of our magnetic structures can look like on one of our compact drivers. It barely fits in the box, okay? So that's the kind of thing that, that uh, you can do if you're an engineer, you own your own company, and you don't have to go through budget meetings or whatever. You just put the best damn thing in the first place, and that's, that's kind of the approach that we take here. We had a couple other questions there, Phil. Sure. And I know you have so many different applications and and products, but one one person asked if you thought about making all of your speakers open baffle on the top, like you do the flagship speakers. And then yeah, you know, question, our, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, okay, what first half of that. Yeah, first half of that is uh, we're when you see our new website that's going to be out within a month or so you'll see that we've divided our speaker systems into classifications. And in what we call the master series, they're pretty much going to be all open there, uh, mid-range systems. Um, uh, I like even the, the mid base to be open air if possible. And that's what you see on B, Beller, um, and uh, uh, Eris, for example. And so those are all falling into the master collection. It's a great way to go. and. Today, with, with room correction capability, you can leave the base omnidirectional and then still steer it. So there's, there's no downside anymore. In the old days, we had to put, like the whisper system, we had to build an acoustic gun that fired in sequence to create um, an arrival uh, with directional characteristics. So it was like, it was worked just like a shotgun microphone works, pop, 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 all down one line. And uh, with, uh, technology today, with, for example, with our wavelet, we can steer that base without having to, to do that. And then someone asked if you use anechoic chambers in your testing or development. Yeah, in, in the early days, I used them a lot. Um, when I worked with Allen Oregon Company, um, they had really nice, um, this was back from 1997 to 2006, um, work with them uh, and as my partners and using their DSPs technology and their anechoic chamber they had out in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And what was interesting about that is that it's the first time I really got a chance to listen to music in an anechoic chamber. And I found that people talk about that music sounds dead and dry in an anechoic chamber. I don't think so. Uh, I listened to a number of recordings and um, on a, a highly directional speaker like Whisper in there. And the ambience that's in the actual recording just dominates mm -hmm. and goes way up. Now, if you're waiting for room engagement, create ambience, that's, you're not going to get it. But if there's any ambience in the recording, my goodness, is it ever evident because the noise floor is so low that uh, you're, you're, the ambience comes way up. So, yeah, I, I, I like anechoic chambers for studying things. Um, the advantage today is that you can curve splice and you have digital methods of, of making measurements as if they were quasi anechoic and getting a large, I think John Atkinson at Stereo File does an awful lot of that today. He'll measure something at, at 50 inches before the, the floor can bounce back and uh, the wall behind can bounce back and then he'll add the base into that. Interesting. 
Oh, let's see. I think we got all the questions answered for the moment. I'll keep my eyes open for the next. What do you guys got planned next? I think I'm on mute. I don't know how. Yep. There you go, Bill. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll head over uh, and I'll do a little demonstration of what the uh, Wavelet entails um, and kind of go an overview as far as what feature sets are available with it. Um, if you guys give me a few minutes, I'll get set up over there and uh, yeah, we'll be right with you. Bill, I know oh, one wow, of the wow. things, one of the things we always love to ask uh, presenters and manufacturers is, what do you listen to at home? Do you listen at home or is it enough at work that you take a break at home? I would say three to four hours a day at home. I listen. Oh, yeah. wow. And I wait till my wife to go, go to sleep and listen to the last three. Uh -huh. But yeah, I, I have to have it. I have to have it. It's, uh, I have a ridiculous amount of music on hard drives and I love exploring new stuff and you know I, I used to when you when you had these genius type things as they called it on I, iPads or whatever or iTunes but the, these these things where they now construct a play with playlist based on your tastes and uh, in the old days I would just simply find a classic song and then find the who sung it the best so I might have seven or eight recordings of Unchained Melody or something like that. and uh, but Today, it's it's much more fun than that because um, you know the, the search characteristics are, that they have on these this the software today. I mean, any young person, if he gets in the room and you know has some kind of music library already, and then starts using that to link up to all these other things, wow, what a tool! The, the utility of an audio file system today is is a magnitude uh, more capable than it was when we were growing up. Even better than just five years ago. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to keep getting better. And I, I'll say this, but I, I strongly believe we're in an audio renaissance right now. Nice. And uh, the idea that, that Beyonce's got 35 Grammy Awards is kind of sad because and nothing against Beyonce, but um, obviously she's married to a guy who's very influential in the industry also. But if you look at it and you think that, that Queen, uh, Journey, uh, I think even Elvis Presley had one Grammy his entire life. And uh, so you, you go down the line and you look at the talent, people that had no, no such awards. Today, you don't need an industry behind you to be heard. And that's a beautiful thing. You know? so. And then someone has to listen with headphones. And which ones are they? You know, I listen to, I've had a number of sets of headphones. And I tend to like, in general, electrostatic or electrets. Um, and I'll tell you, the sleeper that was out there the last five years was that Oppo headphone that they quit making. Oh. That was a great design. The, it was just an absolute killer transducer. Somebody ought to pick that up and run with it. But... Uh, and it's, it can be made better with better materials, but the design was just phenomenal. But yeah, I, I listen to in ear. Depends what stage of sleep I'm trying to head towards. But I'll, I'll often fall asleep with with the earbuds in. It. Nice. Bryce, it looks like you're ready to roll. I sure am. Uh, hopefully, the feedback. Uh, I'm kind of running with an open uh, mic just from the, my Mac. Um, so hopefully you guys can kind of hear what sort of signals and whatnot the wavelet can generate. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. And I'm going to try and do a uh, share my screen so you can see kind of the ins and out of the functionality of the wavelet remote as well. So let me see if I can get into that. Uh, hey, Bryce, why don't you start with what a wavelet is? Yeah, sure thing. So the wavelet is our flagship DSP two-channel processor. And it also has the functionalities of a preamp and has a really nice set in it as well. Um, it's got two sets of XLR inputs, two RCA inputs, 
And uh, of course, you know, your digital full set of uh, inputs as well with the uh, USB input, a SPDIF and a TOSLINK input. And as far as a, a, a unit goes, it, it puts a lot in a single box as far as functionality goes. It, you, you, it really takes the pressure off, you know, what your, your dependability on a separate DAC and allows, you know, really to consolidate the system entirely into one unit. And the really the, the specialized thing about this unit is, is it, it's got a really nice ability and what's it's different than other DSP crossovers is it's got this time domain room correction. And so what this wavelet can do is it can judge how your speaker should be interacting. With you. So it's analyzing the room itself, but then how your speaker with our target function that we program into the unit. And it takes what the room is giving the speaker as it should be and then correcting it within the time domain. And it does do some frequency domain um, adjustments um, a, a little bit, but it mainly is really kind of shaping the wave launch within the time domain. And you can see Vic's got the front panel all set up there. So all the functionality you can access from the front panel on the wavelet, but the best way really to get in, in the ins and outs of the features is going to be on the web remote. And I'll walk you through as far as how to get that up online and things like that. But yeah, it's a very, um, sleek piece of gear there um you know minor buttons on the front there um and it's got a nice course of digital knob as well uh, as the front and that's all adjustability and vic if you can kind of yeah there you go so there's the input section and vic if you can kind of show the outputs as well and the nice thing is that you can have the functionality of a, of a quad amp speaker uh, all ran passively or internally there you go yeah Hey, and also, you can you know have just a setup of a biamp speaker. Let's say our air speaker uh, is basically a biampable speaker with the internal amplification on the base section. The top section is going to be passive, but then you can also have additional subwoofers off those outputs as well. And so that all the programming can be you know adjusted as you like it. Um, and you can also, what's nice with that as well, is you can have all sorts of you know, triamp speakers off that. And they're all, as far as what we can do programming here at the factory, if you've got a, uh, a triamp, oh, a panel speaker, and you've, if you've got a custom built speaker and you've already got those crossover points ironed out from your own um, testing and whatnot, we can program those filters into that unit. So it, it, it gives the DIY crowd a lot of flexibility as well because it adds the ability to set a target function for that DIY speaker on our end and then have the room correction correct that speaker within their space. So it's a really powerful piece of gear. I'm a little familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, Albert's uh, oh, probably just over a month now playing around with his. Uh, he's got, so his uh, wavelet is a special unit with the Valor and so the Valor pulls the ability of the SUT uh, programming on top of what the wavelet does standard as far as functionality goes. So there's a few models that we have right now, uh, the Valor included that has this SUT technology. And this is something that's um, selectable. Uh, and that's the nice thing about the wavelet is you can come in and out of it and always toggle on and on your room correction. So you can hear what your speaker would be sounding like without this time domain correction. So you're gonna have this sort of bass blur uh, and a lot of people have never heard bass truly perfect in a room before, as far as a wave launch goes, the interaction with your room. And the average, I'd say, customer that gets a chance to listen to the wavelet kind of says, well, where does the bass go after you turn on the correction? And, and really, you're hearing for the first time, you're not hearing the room reflection and the room uh, imposing itself on the audio signal. So you're really getting the room taken out of the equation. And so you're really just letting the speakers be themselves as they should be from the designer. And whereas the SUT on top of the already the time domain correction, it's including what's already the ambient information back into the recording as well. So it's a two step process where we're refining the speaker away from the room, but then we're also including the recording process back into the playback. So it's a two step, two fold process there what the wavelet gives our customers. And so I'm gonna, oh, go ahead. I'll ask a question just coming in here as you're talking about it. Someone asked what the sampling rate is. I know that I answered that question. It's at 56 bit, but they asked what bandwidth and alignment of anti-aliasing and reconstruction filters are used. 
<laughs> well, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> yeah, we're using, first of all, we're using an apodizing filter. Um, and uh, we, there's a lot of proprietary things going on on the deck itself to get the sound characteristics from it. Um, keep in mind too, that this is an eight channel. We have eight channels of codec here. Um, we have two channels coming in, but up to eight channels output. So there are eight channels of DAC going on here. Um, the uh, bit rate is, is 56. Um, the uh, sampling frequency uh, is at 96, and that will that will be increased in the very near future. We've already got the work done on that. Um, the uh, overall filtering that's going on, it's funny. You can you can have a, a state of the art DAC, but the results you get out of it have a lot to do with the implementation of the DAC itself. Um, just like you can have output transistors in an amplifier or what have you. And so what you do with that technology is, is really key. And we're using some pretty, pretty smart people uh, on, on that side of it. Now, obviously, we're using a lot of evaluation. I can't stand a, a DAC that sounds harsh. Um, any pre-ringing, for example, has got to go. I don't, it, your ear is so susceptible to a pre-ring. Um, we're used to post ringing because everything, if I bend a ruler over the edge of a table and go, boing, well, I don't hear that boing before I hear the ruler snap. And, uh, but that's what digital does. Digital actually has a pre ring. So you got to get that garbage out of there. And that's one of the first things we do. Um, and, uh, there's a number of good epidizing filter technologies out there. And, um, I, I think there's two or three people doing it the same way we're doing it from what I can read in their own outside literatures. But it's a it's a very good technique. Um, but the DAC implementation, uh, we're squeezing a lot more out of that technology. But you got to understand, too, that if you look at my background, um, I partnered with the Allen Oregon Company back in 1997. And I... Uh, did this with the understanding that this is the state of the art in um, music processing at the time. They were licensing all kinds of technology to Yamaha. And uh, everybody thinks Yamaha developed all their own technology. Well, let me tell you, they were getting a lot of it from, from them. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, when it comes to digital processing, you have to have audio in mind. But I will say that if you know what's going on with the Hubble telescope and you look at what's going on with, with the filtering that's going on with that scope to improve focus and, and resolution way beyond what the lens is capable of doing due to the digital uh, calculations going on for correction. And so when you correct a system using the wavelet, it's correcting everything in that system the, what the amplifier did to flavor the sound, the wires, uh, the, the room influence. Um, it, it, it'll even, if you have something buzzing off to the side, it'll even um, look at that. And, and I, I, I saw this once at a show, and it was kind of funny, but there was a, a rattling the thing, object off to the side, and then it reduced the energy from that also. So um, you always want to try to quiet your room before you do that. It's, it's amazing what, what, what we can do digitally today. So I like how you're addressing the three ringing. Yeah. Can yeah, you do anything about constant ringing? Post ringing or, or ear? Constant, ear? constant ringing. Oh, like ringing in the ears like yeah. tinnitus? Yeah. But, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that, but I won't, I won't elaborate on that. But yes, I have some thoughts on that also. I'll um, look forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, if, 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 if you sync it uh, and you have the person's ability to sync that frequency, um, there's some sleep tones that you can, you can see on that. Um, there are function-generated sleep tones, and you can create multiple uh, tones and overtones. And I've experimented with that a bit. And um, keep in mind, phasing and 
cancellation acoustically and in the brain are two different things. But if you can find the frequency where the, uh, that steady state ringing is, you can invert that tone, line it up in phase, and, and diminish it in the hearing mechanism, yes. Mm. That'll be an experiment, I like. Yeah, there's lots, lots of avenues for the acoustic engineer today. All right, Bryce, I think we see your screen up there. Great, great. So every wavelet um, has an individual serial number. Of course, uh, I've already logged into ours. Um, and so this is a wavelet right now I've got in our demonstration uh, facility uh, across the street from where Bill is located in the uh, offices. And yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and run through exactly as far as the whole layout of the wavelet. Um, just give you guys, as far as a sophisticated piece of gear goes, it's relatively easy to use. And I just want to get kind of the hands-on experience with uh, our kind of new uh, DSP unit here. So, of course, this is the standard main master page here with, with master volume and whatnot. But probably all the fun stuff is going to be located here in the setup page. And just kind of give you a warning, make sure you got all the connections going. And so on a system that's as sophisticated, let's say as Albert's, where he has a four-way ampli amplified speaker, um, you can go into your ping channels menu, make sure you have everything set up. And each individual channel, make sure my volume is going to be turned up so you guys can hear all our white noise pings. But you actually be able to tell as far as verify your connections going. And it might seem like a minor thing, but... When you've got eight different XLR cables running in and out of uh, amplifiers, it's always kind of key to set up the ping channels and whatnot. And so I'll go ahead and ping our, so as far as expl explaining how the wavelet's laid out, so it's a two by four processor. And it's a four way processor per channel um, with the left, the top bank and the left channel is gonna be one through four and your right channel is gonna be five through eight. And so with ARIS, uh, which is right now what I have programmed and set up over here. One and five is gonna be our base outputs and two and six would be our upper range outputs. And so let's say if you had a, um, oh, a Martin Logan um, expression speaker, um, it's a two-way speaker, of course. So your one and five would be your woofer or your two and six would be your upper range and your panel. And then if you had subwoofers in the room, you could also have them on four and eight or if you're a four subwoofer kind of guy, uh, around your, your couch and, and instead of your front ones. You can add those on three and seven as well. So you get a lot of flexibility as far as how you want to program this wavelet and, and the whole output matrix as well. So if I select channel two, we should get a buzz, um, a, a, a white or pink noise pulse from the top, top section of our air speaker. So it's just a little brief two, three second pulse there, verifying that everything is up and running with our amplification with the speaker. So I'll go to our back button. And um, with a nice thing about the Wavelet 2 is you have the ability. So let's say if you've got a completely passive speaker, um, but it's a three-way speaker and you're trying to come in from three different amplifiers. Let's say you've got a class D amplifier with a gain of around 28 dB. Whereas, you know, your two and six could be your mid range and you've got a solid state amplifier that has a, oh, a gain of let's say of 20, uh, 22, where let's say if you're going to a tube amplifier on your tweeters a really delicate, oh, you know, uh, whatever that could be a Raven audio piece or a, a Prima Luna piece, um, you could have the sensitivity of that, uh, let's say it's down to 16 as far as gain. And so what the nice thing is with the wave is you can automatically adjust gain for those different speakers uh, for the different amplifiers within your system. And I'll set that back to zero here. And then where the fun part is, is each wavelet will also have a individual custom microphone calibration with a, a text file and whatnot that identifies the microphone and how to apply the target function to, to as far as what the microphone's picking up. So not every microphone is gonna be your standard flat microphone. They're all gonna have different variances in the microphone itself. And so it's key to also have that microphone calibration file installed into the unit. 
And I've got the microphone right now. This is as far as the readout goes is how that microphone should be set up. Typically, the best way to gauge the speaker within the listening space is about four feet out on Twitter access and at Twitter height. So on the listener's access and at Twitter height on that. And I've got everything set up here. Um, so I'll go ahead and measure our right channel and make sure our volume, volume needs to be set at 85. So we'll go ahead and turn that up. And typically with this setup over here, you've got plenty of gain right at 82. So 85 is kind of a starting point, but I've learned over here in this room itself, 82 is plenty of, plenty of level. So we'll go ahead and measure the right channel. I remember that at my house. <laughs> it never sounded so deep. I didn't know that sweep was so deep before. Yeah, when it, people get that 10 hertz coming out of there, like, what the heck is that? Hey, shake the house. And so you can like, I'll walk you through the left channel, but basically this the computer itself will upload. You can upload that setting. It typically, typically takes about 10 minutes or so to upload. And the nice thing is when you get these measurements uploaded, we can actually see as far as what that speaker looks within your recording space. So it's a nice indicator for us as you know, customer support, but also it gives us a lot of uh, data points within our system and, and as far as what we collect on rooms and seeing exactly how our speakers are matching up in, you know, let's say Ralph in Philadelphia has a 15 by 15 room. We can see how Eris reacts in that 15 by 15 room. Or if you've got, let's say, um, focus in a large room as, as far as the listening hall goes of 35 by 20 and with 10 feet uh, to let's say 15 feet ceiling. So you've got these large spaces and then we can see how our speakers with every single wavelet we have out in the field, these data points, we can collect and see how our speakers are reacting in these rooms with the time domain information we're collecting. And so when we get back in the design room of maybe a next model or better yet, just making a, a tweak to let's say uh, how focus performs. We can say, you know, we're, we're having troubles, right? Let's say at, you know, 35 Hertz uh, within these rooms that are larger. So if, if Ralph, and that's a nice customization ability we have with Bill constantly always being in on the tuning process is he can go in and say, well, if, if Ralph in Philadelphia has this larger space, we could also apply that into his, either the wavelet side of things, the special programming there, or, on the front end of it with the passive uh, crossover as well. And uh, yeah, and also I'll walk you through some more features here. Um, Bill was talking about the uh, pre-ring and appetizing circuit as well. So we can also go in there and you can hear the nice thing with the wavelet as well. These are all selectable things where it allows the user to self-program it. So if you've got a preference of, you know, well, I've, I typically like, you know, I want my DAC, let's say you're, you're wanting to have a DAC outside of the wavelet. You know, you want to have that, all the color out, the coloration of your own DAC pass through the wavelet as the crossover unit for your system for, let's say your V speakers, but you want to have the DAC upstream from the wavelet. You can always come into that, into the wavelet from your preferred DAC and have all these settings, excuse me, selected off. That way you're running the wavelet completely neutral uh, into the system. And the preset function, this is something that Bill's had through for many, many years. His original processor, the Stridium processor, had what, and he can explain this perhaps better than I could, but the L minus R circuit that he's developed back in the, in the early to mid 90s, this is also selectable with your standard stereo processors as well. In this setting, though, too, or this page as well, with the Valor speakers, this is where your Omnio and SUT would be selectable and turnable and, and selectable, toggable on and off. And this is the page that really allows the user to customize uh, the Wavelet's performance here. And what this contour page is, 
you've got, you know, your old school parametrics where you've got about 10 to 20 bands where you can go in and, and equalize exactly how you, you want the system to, to sound. But what's, what Burton and Bill have developed over the years is you'd like to have the control of not necessarily overriding what the room correction is doing within the time domain. And so they developed what we call these minimum phase contour adjustments. And so in a, in a small hotel room, I can remember a great example at Capital Audio Fest, uh, we had a pair of calibers set up with foundation subwoofers in about a 15 by oh, 20 room. And so this base was just astronomically large. And so what the wavelet did though, as far as you know, analyzing this information is it really trimmed that base information and you know, made it so you couldn't necessarily have that giant resonance in the room, but it almost over impacted as far as what our human ear prefers. And what the nice thing is with these minimum phase adjustments is you can go in at our low base adjustment here, and this is right at uh, 50 Hertz. And you can go in and add up to 9 dB of gain back into the signal. But the nice thing with these adjustments is they're all minimum phase. And so they're not gonna corrupt what the time domain is doing on the on the um, in the processing section of the wavelet as well. And of Can course, you tell me oh, go ahead. what frequencies are at the different settings. Yeah, so these are all um, shell filters minus the punch. This is a, a notch, a very tight notch, right at fifty five. It's centered at fifty five hertz. Uh, the low base, challenging my memory here, Albert. The low base is at sixty. Uh, the mid base is at one fifty. And the upper base is at 200. The low treble is at, is at 3K. And then brilliance is at everything above 10K. Okay. Yeah, you'll notice there's no mid-range setting. And the reason is, is we don't mess with that. That's what it's hinged around. So if I want to have a little more accent of mid-range, I should lower the other settings? Yeah. Or, okay. yeah, you can. Or, or in your case... Because you're a four-way, you could actually go into your manual settings on um, your inputs one through four, uh, and you could say, okay, I want to bring up my, my mid-base, for example. Um, you can do that by selecting the mid-base channel. Yep, and that would be what goes to both the internal amplified upper and lower 14-inch mm -hmm. uh, as well that's as right. to the amplifier that's driving the that's right. coax 14 inch yeah so and when you make adjustment like that you get a you get a, a a tonal change but it never uh sounds like a, a an equalizer it, it's just uh, it's it's uh this kind of change in warmth unless you could abuse it i guess but you can you can change it a db or two there um we had a customer who had a valor in a very small hard room in out in what was he in New Jersey? Uh, oh, North, North Carolina. Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, Cary, North Carolina. And what was interesting about that was that um, he he liked that U forty seven sound on for Sinatra, and uh, of the Neumann U forty seven bloom, and uh, so he had a couple dB of bump on those big fourteen inch mid mid ranges and. Mm -hmm. did exactly what he needed to get done because he was sitting on the near field. So instead of making a particular frequency on the contour, I can play around with some of the individual amp uh, dB settings. Yeah. The downside is, if you do that, you can't save the contour into the library. You'd have to come back and readjust it. And I've found that uh, in general, um, you're better if you use the contours and just trim back from the other side. But yes. this, this is useful. There's no question about it. Uh, I'll check it out. Yeah, it's a good way to it's a good way to get familiar with uh, the, the speaker and what each part of it's doing. Also, mm -hmm. someone just asked, uh, "What are the DA chips used in the wavelet?" You know, we. We don't want to disclose everything we're doing there, okay. um, but what I will tell you that there's there's it, it's funny that, that that I would say there are three DACs out there that are quite comparable today that you can pick from. Um, well, analog devices is one of them, and 
the other two are a little bit more esoteric. And uh, what I tell you is, is that I'm not locked into any one of those devices if one gets better. So I'm not going to I'm not going to brand preach on the DAX because that stuff is in constant development. And I would rather just go with the best one. Yeah. So. That's fair That's answer. Fair. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, any more questions at all, Albert? You think you want me to run through on the uh, wave overview? Uh, there was only one other question. What are the asymptomatic slopes of the filters and the equalizer contours? Oh, what are the slopes of them? If they're, are they symmetric or? Yeah, they're, they're shelf contours. So they kind of work. Um, they're minimum phase devices, so they don't act like a graphic EQ or a parametric EQ. Um, you're going to get a, a, a soft transition, and it's going to start at that turnover frequency. And it's about uh, when we say it's at, at uh, for example, brilliance theta kicks in at, at, at 10K. So that, that shell filter um, is, is actually up at 10K. And uh, if, you, if you boost it at 3 dB, it would be up 3 dB. But the transition down is very soft. It's very so slow turnover. Then the rate, yeah, the rate of the slope changes with how far you you boost the contour. So I can't give you a plan of answer because it's going to change as you elevate. Okay. Yeah, Bryce, I think we're caught up. You can go ahead. All right. Well. Um, as far as anything else on here, uh, that's basically the main setup goes uh, of, of the unit itself. Um, the nice thing about the wavelet as well, I'll run through the home theater mode ability as well. So we found out that I'd say probably 40% of the, the wavelet users still do have the wavelet downstream from either oh, a uh, home theater processor or another preamplifier. When listening to home theater. Yeah, and so they, when they you know go into their home theater mode, you can actually select this mode, and select, and the wave will basically just function as just the crossover DSP unit for your front mains, and get out of the way of what you're always you know uh, manipulating and controlling with the home theater processor. So it's a nice it, the way that you know as we market it as a preamplifier, but it is always geared and engineered to be a DSP processor first. And that basically wraps up as far as the overview of the web with those. All right, thank you, Bryce. Yeah. Is there anything else you uh, guys want to give us a taste of or a glimpse of? You know, only thing I would add is that um, we're constantly striving to be better. Um, you know, Bryce knows that we have a number of projects going on right now that the trend will be in high-end audio, will be more DSP, more active loudspeakers, more internally powered loudspeakers. Um, I think uh, a couple of years ago, Stereophile gave a serious look at the ATC loudspeaker, and I was applauding that because Pro Audio has been taking advantage of that kind of stuff for many years. And I think sometimes high-end audio, it, it's a neat, um, Thing because we can we can live in the 50s, 60s, 70s. You can you know you can in terms of the technologies and do contrast. We can still use um, tube tube amps. We can still you know I, I I'm a huge fan of tube microphones. So what am I going to say? I don't like tubes. No, I love tubes. Um, and the same way with uh, analog recording capability. I I have three open reels. I have two of them in the room right now. Um, so when it comes to technologies, it's it's learning to get the most out of what what you're using, what the signal source is or whatever. And what I think we overlook sometimes is how far digital technology has moved. And I'll give me an example of that very briefly. Is that in a mastering studio, there's a device called the Poltec. And what it is, it's a real soft EQ that's very unusual how it works. It doesn't do anything aberrant. 
it's sort of like our minimum phase contours. And you can do like uh, almost a reverse boost or cuts and shapes and stuff like that. But you create, you can, you can adjust the tonal balance. So the mastering engineer gets something in that somebody mixed on some monitors that were a lot different than his super sweet sound and mastering speakers. He can pull things back into spec pretty quickly just with some general corrections. And I think that these things are available today on, on DAWs, digital audio workstations, uh, with, as plugins. So you can get an $8,000 piece of gear as a plugin on, on DSP. Does it sound exactly the same? No, actually, in some cases it sounds worse. Some cases it sounds better. It all depends on how good a job the guy did on the filter emulation for it. But DSP has gone so far, uh, and it will continue to, to move uh, forward, just as streaming has and the quality of. Um, and as we continue to improve our, our, our measurement devices, our comparison devices, if you will, to do these comparisons, just like the spinaural head, um, the smarter we become, the better we're going to get. So um, I, I look in the future for more application of digital. It's going to become more and less, less and less visible to you. It's just going to be there. Um, and I think that uh, more compact designs will become more possible with the higher power capability. And, uh, um, but I think that people are jumping to the conclusions that, you know, wireless is the only way to go, blah, 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 blah. The audio file is going to be awful slow going that route. It's not that you can't do it. And Meridian did it years ago. But when you come right down to it, um, uh, keeping the signal path as true as, it, as we can is really what this is going to be about. And I think that there's lots of great uh, potential on the horizon to keep, keep improving at a very steep rate. 